All right. The first of these uh, uh, named awards in this, this second session, and again, these were selected a year ago, so they've known that they were going to come and present the work at this uh, plenary session. The William T. Hornaday Award is a conservation award that recognizes a student who has made outstanding contributions to the conservation of mammals and their habitats. William T. Hornaday first came to attention as a um, tax taxidermist at the National Mu Museum, also known as the Smithsonian, of course. Hornaday later served as director and curator of mammals at the New York Zoological Park, more commonly known as the Bronx Zoo. It was in this role that Hornaday became known as a conservationist in part due to his efforts to protect the American bison. The William T. Hornaday Award was established in 2004 to honor his, this legacy. <clears throat> the American Society of Mammalogist Conservation Awards Committee selected Roberto Salon Perez for the 2017 William T. Hornaday Award from, uh, William, for the William T. Hornaday Award. Roberto is a Costa Rican biologist who has um, over 11 years of experience working in, on mammal research and conservation with an emphasis on jaguars. His master's thesis research completed in 2003 included the first jaguar and ocelot density estimates in Costa Rica using camera traps. After his master's, Roberto went on to work with the Wildlife Conservation Society and the World, uh, Worldwide Wildcat Conservation Organization, Panthera, as Costa Rican director and Mesoamericana director. Currently, Roberto is working uh, on his PhD in a joint doctoral program um, between Idaho and Costa Rica. <clears throat> so please welcome me in, in uh, please join me in welcoming Roberto to talk to us about his work. Thank you, Robert. Um, first of all, I want to say what a great honor it is to be here in front of you presenting part of what I've done for many years. Um, I want to thank you all and thank the ASM for having me here. Um, I've been lucky enough to be able to um, kind of mingle or combine the work that I do with uh, Panthera with what I'm doing with, on my PhD, which is um, still in the making. As Robert said, I'm a PhD uh, student under a joint doctoral program between University of Idaho and Katia under Lisette Waits from University of Idaho and Brian Finnegan from Katia University in my home country in Costa Rica. So today, I want to tell you a little bit about what we do on the Jaguar Corridor Initiative, which is part of my work as a Costa Rican director and Mesoamerica coordinator. But also I want to tell you a little bit about my ongoing PhD dissertation project, um, specifically about uh, one chapter and the potentials of, the, of, the, of a second chapter, where I want to assess basically the status of a critical corridor that we have in Costa Rica. And also, the potential impacts of the biggest Central American hydroelectric project that occurs in that same corridor. For those of you that do, are not familiar with Panthera's work, uh, we are a wildcat conservation organization working to preserve uh, all the 41 species of wildcats known to, in the world, focusing on those that are most threatened, usually those that are the biggest. And we usually take for granted um, the term umbrella species, and not, there are not so many studies that actually prove that um, species can work as an umbrella, but we have recent um, publications that assess that for the jaguar, specifically protecting uh, other mammals and the habitat in which they, in which they live in. Uh, work with jaguars um, started in the late 70s and early 80s, and Alan Rabinowitz, which is our current chief scientist at Pantera, is one of the pioneers of that work. And thanks to his work in Belize, uh, the first jaguar preserve was established in there. And he continues his work uh, also doing work with other wildcats in the world. 
And at that moment, um, conservation was concentrated on basically establishing protected areas, keeping people out, animals in. But genetics were telling us otherwise in the case of the jaguar. It was telling us that, that the jaguar was able to maintain connectivity throughout its whole distribution. All the way from northern Mexico to Argentina, there were no subspecies of jaguars according to genetics. So what does that mean? It means that the jaguars that we have in Mexico are the same jaguars that we have in Central America and are the same jaguars that we have in the Pantanal. So areas that we once discarded as a habitat that could be used by jaguars, we're now looking into that as corridor habitats or places where jaguars can go from one core area to the other. And jaguars still hold about 51% of a historic distribution according to the last IUCN assessment. But we have lost a lot of ground. And there's a significant reduction in jaguars distribution from the last IUCN assessment in 2008. So it's not crazy to think that in you know, 100, 200 years, we could be looking back and saying that the jaguar has a similar condition to what we have with the tigers. Not a century ago, there were 100,000 tigers in the world, and now they're probably close to 4,000. And as you can see, this distribution has been decreased significantly. And it's almost impossible to think that we can connect all tiger populations that exist today. And just to give you an example that this is not crazy to think that this could happen eventually with the jaguar if we don't do something, this is a map of the jaguar core areas, or what we call the jaguar conservation units, and the corridors between them in light green there. And we consider this area in the center Atlantic of Nicaragua, the Wawashan, to be a jaguar core area. But then we saw the effect of illegal colonization in a supposedly protected area occurring uh, in this area and basically wiping out uh, the forest. Again, 1988, 1999, 2010. So we started by delineating these core areas and the corridors and trying to assess where would be the best place to invest their efforts. So we started verifying those corridors in the ground with a process that we call ground truthing, so basically going there and talking to local people, making interviews, uh, assessing what kind of threats there were and if it was in fact a suitable uh, habitat for jaguars and especially if there were jaguars there. And this is a product of that work that took almost eight years in the making and this is only the portion of Mesoamerica that we were able to analyze recently and was published and shows areas that are critical for connectivity and don't look so good and other areas that are in better shape in terms of connectivity. We've also worked in trying to assess uh, the number of jaguars that there are. And even though this is not a perfect metric, it's based on modeling and the best density estimates available, uh, we already have a rough estimate of how many jaguars there could be in the Americas. But about 90% of that, it's located only in the Amazon. And the rest are fragmented and in some of them, isolated populations in the rest of the distribution. Um, we have also worked on genetics and trying to see if there's functional connectivity between these areas. And <clears throat> this publication by Walsh and other authors, we already are seeing places where there's um, a good gene flow, basically in the Mayan forest, in Belize, uh, Guatemala, and Mexico, but there are other areas where we are already seeing that there could be potentially um, a place where the corridor has been broken. 
So we have to work a lot, and that includes working with government. So we have established memor uh, memorandums of understanding, MOUs, with at least eight countries in the region to work on jaguar conservation. <clears throat> and working on jaguar conservation means also working with some of the main threats that they have. And one of those is the cat-cattle conflict. So jaguars and pumas and other carnivores sometimes get into these um, unforested areas or landscapes that include farms and agriculture, and sometimes they get into trouble. And usually they end up killed. I don't know if you saw this uh, news. It was four days ago, and this is Yoro is one of uh, two jaguars that has been recently photographed in the U.S. in Arizona, and he was killed in Mexico, probably related um, to cat-cattle conflict. So we've worked on that. We've worked on several anti-predatory measures uh, and created manuals to actually learn how uh, farmers can live with jaguars. And to give you an example, in Costa Rica, we created a wildcat conflict response unit, training wildlife officials not only on what to do, but also we were providing um, the economic support to go to the farmers and assessing what was the animal that caused the damage, first of all, and then implementing anti-predatory measures so we could prevent further further losses. And that includes a wide array of different strategies, including fencing, maternity paddocks. We even use uh, bells with um, solar panel lights that come in at night and start blinking. And it's a, it's a great show. <laughs> and um, most of these measures uh, have been like close to 90, 98% um, effective in uh, reducing the risk of further attacks. <clears throat> One of the products that we have for Costa Rica with this unit that, as you can see, uh, can attend cases nationwide, which we couldn't do by ourselves, is the production of this map of predation incidents since 2003, where we can say which were done by Jaguar, which were done by Puma. We have attended ocelot attacks, coyotes, Jaguar rundis, you name it, even dogs. <clears throat> but there are other threats, like development projects. Roads, it's one of the main impacts that we have right now on wildlife. And not only uh, the impacts created by road kills, but in the case of jaguars and probably other large carnivores, the greatest impact that we have been detected is the isolation between populations. So you don't see that many jaguars getting killed on the roads, but studies that have been able to work with telemetry have shown that roads become the border of um, individual home ranges. So they basically are isolating populations. So we've worked a lot on that, and in Costa Rica, alongside with the, uh, several different organizations, we have come with this environmental guide on wildlife-friendly roads that's been implemented by the government, and the government is asking the construction companies to implement this in order to uh, plan mitigation actions related to roads. Other development projects and activities that we should focus on and that some of them we've been working on are agriculture, hunting, of course. We've worked with site security in sites in Honduras and Guatemala, for example. Geothermal projects, mining, and hydroelectric projects. Which bring, bring us to the second part of this presentation, which is part of my PhD dissertation project, where, as I told you, there is the biggest uh, Central American hydroelectric project uh, located in an important corridor for the Jaguar. This project is supposed to give energy to 500,000 households, um, 305 megawatts of energy. Just to give you uh, um, just to familiarize you with Costa Rica, where we're located in Central America. And we're about um, a quarter of the size of Kansas. By the way, I, I like your logo. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
we, even though we're small, we, ho we hold 5% of the world's biodiversity, including 209 species of mammals and six species of wildcats. And the area where my PhD work has focused on is here, where, as you can see, this is a, um, in the back, what we call the backbone of the corridor that would guarantee the connectivity not only between these two complexes of protected areas, but also between Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. So if we lose connectivity in that place, we will be losing regional connectivity as well. So this area is called the Paso del Jaguar, and it's an area that's not um, only forest. It's actually, there's people living in there. We have um, even an indigenous community of the Quebecer group, the Nairia Wari. We have agriculture, we have a lot of um, cattle, um, dairy and uh, meat production. We have whitewater rafting, so if you go there, look for the Pacuati River. It's a great, one of the greatest sites for whitewater rafting. And of course we have still some patches of forest. Um, and basically what we want is for jaguars and other mammals to be able to cross from one place to the other, <laughs> find a mate, and you know, um, have offspring. But there are several impacts in there that you have to consider. We have deforestation. We have hunting, especially of um, the prey the jaguar prefers. We also have roads, two roads that cross the corridor from south to north. We have the biggest hydroelectric project in Central America that is potentially cutting the, the area where the structural connectivity was actually closest in the corridor. We have small hydroelectric projects in another river to the west. We have a possibly uh, uh, an electricity line that's gonna be installed also in the west part. So once you look at that, you know, connectivity may not be that easy. So again, the Reventazon project is probably one of the main impacts there because of its size. It's a seven um, square kilometer reservoir that uh, occurs in the central part of the corridor. And the Inter-American Development Bank is one of the uh, financial entities that are given the money to the Costa Rican Electricity Institute in order to do the work. But they're interested that um, this project doesn't have a negative impact over wildlife. So thanks to our work that we're doing not only um, in science, but also with the people, working with the communities and creating a local corridor that already has 10 years, a local committee of the corridor that already has 10 years, the IDB hired us to basically try to evaluate what were the potential impacts of the hydroelectric project and recommend mitigation actions that would guarantee the functionality of the corridor even with the electric project. So we established uh, 216 camera trap stations, not only in the corridor area, which is this red gridded area, but also in the tips of the two core uh, jaguar populations, which is the Central Volcanic Cordillera and the Talamanca Cordillera, uh, east and west of the corridor. And uh, just to um, illustrate you a little bit on how this occurred, so the construction started in 2010. It would be great to have information before that, but sadly, um, we didn't. So we started placing cameras uh, in the central part of the corridor in these two areas working as intensively as possible in 2013, 2014. Then we moved to one of the um, core areas, the central volcanic, the flooding, which is actu the actual impact that we're trying to measure, started in 2015, while we were having the second survey in the central part of the corridor. The flooding ended in, in 2016, we moved to the other side of the corridor, or to the an other core population, and then once again surveyed the central part of the corridor. So we basically had the before, during, and after phases of the flooding event. 
Methodology was basically uh, based on camera trapping and uh, we did analysis with occupancy modeling and GIS. Some preliminary results because as I said, this is still in progress. I'm still analyzing data. Um, but it's interesting that we found that jaguars occur basically in the east side of the corridor and the core population in the Talamanca. But we haven't been able to find any jaguars on this other side. So we are planning to extend our project farther into the, this core area to assess and understand what is going on here. Because this, as I said, is a critical portion of the country, a critical connect, connectivity um, play site for, for jaguars and other mammals. These are um, locations or where individuals were um, photographed. And I want you to pay attention on this two lines here that are the roads that cross north to south. And that most of Jaguar locations occur um, east from one of those main roads. This is our, some movements of Jaguars where you can see that there's uh, two Jaguars here. They're even located in the same day. Other Jaguars, three Jaguars here sharing areas. So they definitely share areas. Um, there's a different story with other animals, like the ocelot. Ocelots basically occur everywhere. They don't care. They can be in agriculture. They can be in pasture land. They're, these are all the locations that we had with ocelots. So they basically are not using the corridor to move from one place to the other. They're actually living in there. Those are some movements that we've been able to detect um, of the ocelots using the, the spot pattern. And other wildcats, like the puma. You can see that the puma, we did have locations in uh, both sides of the areas that we're uh, wanting to connect. This is the margay, the jaguarundi, and prey species as well. So we did a copency modeling for every of the major species. Um, and also we included there the paca because it's one of the most hunted species in the area as well. And it's an important part of the jaguar side as well. So we're already starting to understand what's occurring in the corridor. Now, this is all data before the flooding event. We also had other um, interesting uh, records, like um, the six species of wildcat uh, in Costa Rica. So we have all the six species in this small portion uh, of the country. And of course, the black jaguar, which is, you know, we call it the pantera but it's basically uh, the same species as a melanistic individual, as you know. And again, if we start to look for reasons of why um, this distribution occurs, you, started to, you start to see certain things. Um, again, if you see the two roads, these dots represent uh, jaguar, puma, uh, or the major prey, and paca detections that we've had so far. And as you can see, there are not so many detections in between those two roads. So it's not, again, it's not only the impact of roads, but all that is uh, related to that. So there's more houses, there are more businesses, there's uh, more deforestation, etc. And if we zoom in to what we call the tail of the reservoir, so basically where the river has its normal uh, size, you can see all these uh, blank uh, circles are circles where we did have cameras, but we didn't detect any of these species. So this is crucial and critical information for the electrical company, because this all occurred before they started the flooding event. And if someone would come later without having this information, making a survey there, and didn't find anything, they would say, oh, it's your fault. You know, you did this. But now they have this baseline data where they know that there were not so many species of these animals there, but they can, with their mitigation actions, try to monitor and see if what they're doing is actually increasing the presence and habitat use of these species in the area. So we also do, did some GIS modeling, trying to assess which corridors would be lost with the reservoir in place, and with the mitigation actions, um, which uh, I'm gonna mention later, uh, including reforestation, also buying of lands around the reservoir, 
How it, does that connectivity look? And what are those patches that are most important for connectivity of these animals? And as you can see, the darker the patch, the more important it is. So in the central part, once the, the reservoir is in place and the mitigation actions are taken, this central patch will be crucial to maintaining the connectivity. And it would mostly be owned by the electrical company. So we've been lucky enough to work in a project where we can you know, do the science work, but also give these results to the electrical company. And they are actually making some um, mitigation actions to try to have an, a positive effect on the area. So one of the things that they've done is to implement payment for environmental services. So basically all the land owners in what, again, what we call the tail of the reservoir are being um, paid for just preserving the forest. So some of them might think, you know, I'm going to just chop this forest so, because I need more ground for my cattle or I need to, um, uh, I don't know, have a, another agriculture activity. Now they have this incentive just to, just to leave the forest alone. So we hope that in the future, these actions would entail you know, the recuperation of some of these uh, animals. Other, other mitigation actions include the buying of land for protection, as I said, around the reservoir. The electrical company owns um, all the land around the reservoir and bought more land that they needed for the construction just for conservation, reforestation, They've uh, also done some corridor signage and anti predatory uh, preventive strategies. So, in the near future, what I'm working on is to try to see if I can detect habitat use estimates um, or changes of these estimates between the year one or before the flooding phase, year two during, and then year three after. And what I would expect to find is kind of a refugee effect where animals will be moving away um, from the flooding event and then everything would st uh, stabilize later. And if mitigation actions work, we would also hope to see um, some of these mammals um, start to colonize these areas, especially in the, in the tail of the reservoir. So with that, I want to thank all of the local communities, farmers, landowners, field assistants, students, organizations, and funding organizations that uh, have made this work possible. So thank you very much. And I'll... Thank you, Rebecca. We've got time for a couple of questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, the question is if um, there are plans to mitigate the effects of roads. Um, so yes, uh, we've been working also with the electrical company because one of the compensation actions that they made is to pave one of those roads. One of those roads was, was a highway, so it's already paved, but the other was a gravel road. And I didn't show you that, but we have data from when it was a gravel road and then when it was paved. And there is a significant increase on road kills, uh, especially on medium and large mammals, uh, due to increased velocity and frequency of vehicles. And so we've worked with them and they've installed signage and they uh, have installed arboreal passes. Uh, but um, even though we recommended underpasses, they're very expensive and you know, they, they couldn't make those, but we're working on, on other mitigation actions, yeah. One more? Okay. So I was wondering if you're not finding uh, the jaguars or things that jaguars eat in the roads, what are you finding on those camera traps? Oh, uh, what, I'm, what we f are finding in um, those cameras in between the two roads are basically smaller mammals. Um, so, you know, there's a, I didn't show you the data for like armadillos and um, possums 
and agoutis, other species that are um, well adapted to that area in between. As, and as I showed you, you know, the ocelot, for example, is one that uses the whole corridor area and it's probably eating, you know, those mammals alongside reptiles and birds and others. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Don't run off just yet. Okay. <clears throat> This award comes with a plaque. I would like to read the inscription. It says W.T. Hornaday Award for lasting scientific contributions to the conservation of mammals and their habitats, presented to Roberto Salon Perez in recognition for his scientific and policy contributions on large felids. He demonstrates what is possible when scientists apply their research to help shape conservation policies. Thank you. Thank you very much.